Good morning. Let's all stand. It's your name. The mountains shake and crumble. It's your name. The oceans roar and tumble. It's your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. again for another opportunity just to come as the body of Christ and bask and bathe in your presence this morning you know Lord just to open our hearts again today with our brothers and sisters in Christ and tell you Lord just how much we love you how much Lord we appreciate all that you have done for us Lord, to express our gratitude to you, Father, this morning in worship. Lord, to open up our hearts to your word that we might hear it again. And Lord, just to let that work of the Spirit in our hearts that we might be obedient children to our Father. And so, Lord, we're just so looking forward with anticipation and expectation to what you're going to do in and through us this morning. So, Father, fill this place with your presence, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's kids would say, amen, amen. amen. Hey, let's remain standing. Turn your 
spread out the stripes over empty space. Said that there be light. Dark and formless world, your light was born. You spread out your arms over empty hearts. Said, Let there be light. Through a dark and hopeless world, your son was born. the world and saw that it was good. You sent your only son through our good. What a wonderful maker. What a wonderful Savior. How majestic you will Bye. 
Here is my life, come and take it from me Jesus, you make me complete you and my side, I can know no boundaries You are God, high above the earth Angels sing for you Mountains melt the sound of your name Oceans roar for you all of creation gives you praise The angels sing for you The mountains melt and the sound of your name The oceans roar for you All of creation gives you praise You are God high above the earth You are God, high above the earth, high above the
promise. You know, Lord, I think we need to sing that song more because sometimes we doubt. And sometimes, Lord, the cares of this life overwhelm. And sometimes, Lord, we allow fear and worry and anxiety and fret and nervous tension to rule our hearts instead of the peace of God. Oh, Father, help us. You know, we are a fickle people, and that's why you probably called us the sheep of your pasture, because sheep are dumb. They are so fickle, they'll even follow a goat. And Lord, I thank you that you are our shepherd. And that, Lord, your promises are true. And you've never failed, not one person, nor will you ever fail your promises, Lord. Lord, when you promised us, Father, that that which you began in us, you will finish, Lord, we can just rest in that and the work of the Lord in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, when you said that you're going to supply all of our needs, not our wants, but our needs, according to your riches in heavenly places through Christ Jesus, Lord, that's what you meant. Lord, the Gospels tell us that you know our need before it. We even ask. And, and Father, they tell us that if you love the sparrows and know every need they have and you feed them, and you know when each one of them falls, how much more do you care for your sons and daughters? Lord, you know what our physical needs are. You know what our spiritual needs are. You know what our emotional needs are. Lord, you know the areas that we're struggling in. You know, I love that verse in Romans 7 where Paul said, I myself, the real me, the spirit man, serves the law of the Lord in my inward parts. But there's this other guy that hangs around and, and he's called the flesh and, and he loves sin. And, and Paul, you remind us that it's a battle. The spirit against the flesh, this flesh against the spirit. And we're in this constant battle, Lord. And, and sometimes we win and sometimes we lose the battle. That is, we've never lost the war. God, help us. Give us strength. Give us strength, Lord, this morning to live as we desire to live, and that is in service for you, Father. It is our passion. It is our desire to be well-pleasing, never to grieve you, Lord, or disappoint you or grieve the Holy Spirit. So help us in those areas, Father. And God, for those that are, you know, away on this three-day holiday, Veterans Day on Monday, they, those that get it off and are gone. Father, bless them as they travel. Keep them safe as they come home. And Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that when I'm in this place with my brothers and sisters, Lord, I feel your presence. I felt it this morning. And when I raise my voice to you in song, as an expression of my heart. Lord, I feel your pleasure. And as, Lord, we're worshiping and I'm just repenting, Lord, for just being sometimes so dull and so dumb. In those areas of my attitude and in those areas of my actions, as I'm just asking you once again to forgive me, Father, what I find is you are so faithful. I just feel your love in this place. Lord, I feel your grace and your mercy. Lord, I feel your forgiveness. And Lord, there are times when I feel your discipline, and that's a good thing, because you only discipline them that you love, and you only discipline those that are yours. And I thank you even those moments when I feel the discipline, because I know that you're still my father. And I'm still your son. Yet you haven't told me to pack my bag and change my name and leave. I thank you for that, Lord, because you never will. Oh, what a blessing it is. Lord, my heart leaped this morning as we were worshiping because that thought penetrated, you know, the dullness of my mind. What a privilege and blessing it is. Lord, I'm, I'm a son of the living God creator of heaven and earth. 
and I will never not be your son. And how I thank you, Lord, again this morning for the privilege, as the rest of us are doing the same, for the privilege of being able to call you our Father. Our Father. Our Father. And the thought this morning that in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would not have told you. Jesus said he goes away to prepare a place for us. And when he's done, he's coming back. That where he is, we might be also in our Father's house. Man. You know, Lord, I'd, I'd just like to take that trip today, if it's possible. It'd be really cool if we could. But if not, Lord, give us the strength to live every day with that great expectation and that great hope that you could come at any moment for your church. And so we pray for these things. And of course, we want to pray for Janet, you know, and just as she's going through the grieving process of the loss of her son, for joy, the loss of her brother. I want to hold that before you this morning, Father, as well. Thank you, Lord, that you are gracious. Thank you, Lord, that you have mercy upon your saints. And when, Lord, their lunch is being eaten, Father, by the world, you just call us to go home. Thank you for that, Lord. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. All God's kids would say, amen. Amen. Well, take a few moments and greet one another before you settle into your spot. Good morning.
Okay, let's uh, find our places this morning and we'll get moving. Okay, I got several announcements this morning that I need to make. And if I don't make one of the announcements um, that need to be made, raise your hand if you know what that is. Or if I get it wrong, because sometimes I do um, get it wrong on the announcements. Because some of you guys bring them up right, right at the very end here, and I don't get a chance to peruse them ahead of time. But um, again, Thanksgiving is coming up quickly. If Joy could stand up. There's joy. <laughs> Pastor Aaron always has joy. Every morning. Every morning he has joy. He wakes up and goes, oh, I can't believe you're still here. <laughs> joy in the morning. Anyway, um, Joy is uh, heading up our Thanksgiving meal delivery. So again, if you have somebody, as she announced, that qualifies for one of those meals, and one of the qualifications is they have to be able to cook the meal, please see Joy so that we can bless that family. And if you want to donate to that ministry, um, go ahead and see Joy about that as well. So that's coming up quickly, and we need to take care of that. Um, looking past Thanksgiving, we want to get the Christmas boxes out there, the thing that Franklin Graham heads up. And so after the service, Tamara, she's in the Sunday school ministry today, isn't she? See Tamara afterwards, she'll be standing by those Christmas boxes, you can take one home and there's a little thing, you can fill it out, and put a little card in there and all the stuff that we do and then we'll gather them up. It's got to be done by November the 17th so we can get them on their way to where they need to go. Uh, thirdly, yard sale. We're, we're going to have, and there's some people in our church that have taken upon uh, the responsibility to have a community yard sale. So if you've got stuff you want to sell, um, what they want to do is set up the back lot here with tables. You bring your stuff, community yard sale, we'll advertise it. And so, um, you know, maybe you need a little extra money for Christmas. You know how that stuff goes. And you got some stuff that you don't need anymore that you've been tripping over in your garage and it's worth something, bring it on down. Uh, and then you got to take it away if it doesn't sell. <laughs> That's the deal. And uh, they'll let you know about what the deal is. And looking now even past that to, to Christmas, we have the Christmas play Halo that's uh, coming up, and so we're going to be having these posters. I want you to invite people. Friday night, the Friday before Christmas, the play will be presented down in Rayleigh's Amphitheater. So we're going to try to do a community thing, so if you can bring as many people as you can to that, and then we're going to have it here Saturday night and Sunday morning. Uh, these actors go through a lot of work getting ready for this, and so we want to make sure that um, uh, we, they get to sweat at least three or four times. Not just once. We don't want them just to get it over with and be done. And, and Monday, lastly, Monday is Veterans Day. How many of you knew that? It snuck up on you. Hey, if you're a vet, would you please stand? We want to honor you this morning. If you're a vet. Yeah. You know, listen, s s remain, s remain standing. I want to thank you as your pastor for your service. You know, we have the freedoms in this country we have as long as we still have them because men like you were willing to sacrifice and women like you were willing to make that dedication and commitment to give um, for that purpose. How are us being abused? Listen, your motives were right and you went and served our country and we thank you today for that. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for these vets. And you know, some of them have been in combat. Some of them have seen war, the horrors of war. You know, and, and some of them, Lord, no doubt have the memories sometimes that haunts them of those things. Maybe friends, you know, that are, that are not here. They paid the ultimate price that can't stand here today and be honored. And Lord, we, we pray for these men. And we ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them and bless them, that you would reward them for their service. And we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's sons and daughters would say, amen. amen. You can be seated. Yes, you can plot again. Um, 
You know, the Bible says, blessed are the flexible. No, it doesn't. That's Chuck-isms. Blessed are the flexible because they won't be broken. We need to be flexible. And, you know, I had a guy tell me one time that um, he didn't want anything to do with organized religion. I said, well, then come to our church. Because there's nothing organized about us. And uh, I had forgotten, um, uh, for somehow, I, service, services, I forget when holidays come and all of that, but Veterans Day, there's going to be a lot of people celebrating that that are vets. So Monday night's study, the couple study, will be canceled this Monday night um, because of Veterans Day. We want to honor the vets. We want them to not have to um, come to the, our teaching, but be able to go to, to whatever they're going to be going to um, some of them have prior engagements. And, and what we're doing on Monday nights, if you haven't been going through that, is, is stellar. It is primary. And you'll be, out, be hearing some of the testimonies of that. So the next time we do this couple's uh, love and respect, building blocks for a successful marriage relationship, you're going to want to take it again. Amen. How many are going through that would say that this has been worth your time? Absolutely. Yes. Stellar. So, but we're going to set that aside just in honor of the veterans for Veterans Day this Monday, and so, um, plus I'm probably going to be an emotional wreck. After the service today, we're going to be praying for Mike and Dylan, uh, two more of our, knuck- I mean, young men, I won't call them knuckleheads anymore, are going off to the armed forces. They leave on Monday. We, we take them down to the recruiter in Auburn, and they get that bus ride to Sacramento, and then they get another physical and a swearing in, and off to Fort Benning, Georgia. They go. You know, it's, it's, it's tough for me. I want you to pray for me. In a few moments, Paul's going to say, pray for us. But I want you to pray for me because my wife and I were just talking about it the other night. For 30 years, we've had children living in our home. And this is the last of the Mohicans. This is our baby. I don't care if he's taller than me. I don't care if he can run faster than me. He'll never be able to take me. <laughs> but this is my baby, and he's... My son, the man, is uh, getting ready to go. And, you know, this will be the last night that he sleeps under my roof as a resident. The next time he comes back, he'll be a guest. And things will have changed, you know. So just pray for these young men. We have those photographs as you leave the foyer on the left-hand side because we need to be praying for those. Stephen's here. Boy, he looks sharp, man. Stand up, Stephen. I want, you got, let's look at that again. Wow. How do you keep that from wrinkling? <laughs> There's got to be a secret to the keep the uniform. You guys will learn that. Next time we'll see these guys, they won't be in a uniform. They'll be in the, what they call those BDBs or whatever they are. Yeah, whatever it is, they're work stuff, right? Because they won't have graduated from boot camp. They'll be home for Christmas. Can you believe that? Yeah, they're not a Marine. They're only in the Army. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's... Let, let, <laughs> Hey, let's turn in our Bibles this morning for the last time to 2 Thessalonians. We've come now as far as chapter 3, and we'll pick up there. I don't mean to disc our armed forces at all. (laughs) Father, we thank you so much for your word. For me, these 39 years, it has been a lamp unto my feet, and it has been a light unto my path. Lord, your word has taught me what you have done for me apart from anything that I could ever do for you. Lord, it tells me of your grace and of your mercy, of your love and of your forgiveness. Speaks to me, Lord, of the cost that you were willing to pay to rescue me, Father, from a life of ruin and ultimately from damnation to bring me into this marvelous light and into this wonderful relationship with your son and to give to me everlasting life. Father, I thank you this morning. I still stand in awe of the pit that you were willing to rescue me from. I stand in awe of you, Father, that you love me so much when I hated you as doing everything against you, Lord, that you still loved me and gave your only begotten Son to ransom me. Lord, I thank you for that this morning. And it tells me of your promises, and it tells me of my future. It tells me of your character, Father. All of those things are so important for me. It builds my faith. 
And Lord, as we finish out the final exhortations of Paul in this little epistle, God, may we hear your heart in it. You have some wonderful things to say through this Apostle Paul to us this morning. And so, Lord, open the ears of our understanding and the hearts, Father, so that we can hear, Father, your heart this morning, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And again, all God's sons and daughters would say, amen. Amen. You know, what a pithy little epistle. First and second Thessalonians were the earliest of the Pauline epistles. Uh, most scholars put them around 50, 54 A.D., early on in Paul's ministry as he is on his missionary endeavors and he plants this little church and persecution comes and they have a lot of questions. And it's interesting, in chapter 1, he went through the things that were important that they remained faithful to, always having an attitude of thanksgiving. You know, I find in the time that we're living in, these things to be important to our Christian experience as well. You know, this church was facing some similar things that the church in the 21st century is facing, some persecution from without, some, you know, concern from within, uncertain future, difficulty. And he writes to them in the first chapter just by way of reminder and reminds them, be thankful unto the Lord in every situation. Not thankful for those situations, but thankful in them. Be thankful. Then he reminds us of faith, that their faith. We, we, you know what? Our faith sustains us in those times of difficulty. He talked about faith and love, our love for the Lord and our love for one another. How encouraging is that? And then he talked about endurance. How do we need to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? And then he talked about hope, that we have a hope. Man, don't ever let go of that hope. Hey, listen, by the way, your hope is not in Obamacare. Your hope is not in the current leaders of this world. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. You know, I belong to a government that I'm proud of. And my citizenship is in heaven. And when my king returns, he's going to set up a kingdom The rule of the day is going to be righteousness and it's going to be a kingdom that's going to last forever. I have a hope. The Bible calls it the blessed hope. He talked about the hope and the object of our hope. Eternal life. And then he talked about just resting. Just rest, relax, settle down. It's going to be okay. All things are going to work together for good to those who love God and are calling according to His purposes. So he talked about thanksgiving and faith and endurance and hope, the object of our hope and how we ought to just rest in that hope. And then he moved into chapter 2 where it was a supplement to what he'd already taught about eschatology because there were concerns there. And we went through that and we just kind of looked at where we're at today as far as the eschatology uh, chronology of eschatology goes, and we, we, we looked at that. And if you weren't here the last two weeks, then, then go to the internet and look it up. But as we come now to chapter 3, very interesting. A lot of meat. You know, sometimes people get to the end of the chapter or the book, and in the last chapter they want to rush through because they think they've gnawed all the meat off the bone. Not so in this little epistle. Man, there's meat right on the end of that bone all the way, you know, to the, to the end of it. So let's dive right in. I like this because he says this, finally, my brethren, pray. Pray for us. And there's two things he's going to ask prayer for. But I like it that Paul understood the power of prayer. You see, I think we're living in a day where the church does not understand or has forgotten the power of prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer the Bible declares to us of righteous men and women, it's in the generic, it can be both, righteous people, avails much. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. You know, He's watching you every moment of the day. He's watching you because He loves you. You remember those days when you first met your spouse and you'd go out to dinner and you'd pitch woo? 
Anybody know what pitch and woo is? Raise your hand if you do. That's an older thing, isn't it? Uh, today it's flirting. You remember you had set across there. When you weren't looking at her, you were looking at whether she was going to finish the hamburger or not because you were still hungry because you'd already eaten yours. <laughs> you remember those days and you would look into her face and oh, wow. Man, you are the most beautiful thing. You say things like, heaven must be searching because there's an angel missing. You know, you'd say things like that. The passion and the love. Well, you know, Paul is saying, pray for us. That we remain there. Get this, there's, there's several times throughout all the epistles that Paul asks for prayer. Because he understood the power of prayer. He understood that prayer brought you into a relationship with God. Prayer brought you face to face to the one you love and it kept you in that relationship. And he understands that because he says in Romans chapter 15 verse 30, Now I beseech you brethren for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the work of the Holy Spirit that you would strive together with us in your prayers to God for me. Paul is saying that when you are praying for him and when you're praying for other ministries, when you're praying for each other, it's a work that is going on where God is using you through the work of the Spirit as you are laboring together with others to bring about a benefit for the kingdom. Prayer does that. How many have unsaved loved ones? How many have been looking for opportunity to witness to those unsaved loved ones? Well, let me give you a little clue here. Pray for them. Pray that God would open up an opportunity and more importantly, open up their hearts. Prayer is important. And, and to the Corinthian church, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul writes this. You also helping together by prayers for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by the means on your behalf. When you are praying, praying, and praying, it benefits the body of Christ. He says this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, praying always. Do you realize that you can be in an attitude of prayer? This is one of the things I appreciate most about my Christian experience. That I literally have learned that I can pray all day long. I'm in a constant attitude of prayer. Listen, I'm in connection with heaven. I just have an open line. I like that I can have an open line. We're just at any moment, I'm driving and I'm praying. Uh, let me tell you about prayer, though. Be careful about prayer. Don't pull over and pray. <laughs> I found out this week that you just can't pull over and pray. Now, there are laws that say that I can't answer my cell phone and drive. And I don't have one of those Bluetooth things. I'm not in this hip generation where, you know, I walk around with this thing stuck on my ear and look like I'm out of Star Trek or something. So I literally, when the phone rings, I have to pull my car over. The phone rang the other morning and I pulled my car over there in 49, just down the road from my house. A lady was on the phone, needed prayer for her families. Something was going on. So after I got off the phone, I did what she asked me to do. I prayed. Now, I'm old school prayer. I like to bow my head and close my eyes. So I'm bowing my head and I'm closing my eyes and I'm praying exceedingly and fervently for this situation. And listen, before the week was out, God answered that prayer. But I'm praying. When I'm done praying, I start my car up and I leave. I don't find out till Wednesday the stir that my prayer caused. Because one of our board members came up, Gary who used to be the captain of the Nevada County Sheriff's Department, still has this scanner, said, hey, listen, I heard on the scanner the other day there was a white pickup truck pulled over right down from your house, and there was a man slumped over the wheel. They thought he'd had a heart attack. <laughs> they called the fire department and the police, and they were sent to go check this guy out. When they got there, he was gone. <laughs> prayer. I guess I'm going to have to learn to watch and pray. But prayer, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We need to pray. Philippians 1.19 says, For I know 
that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayers. Paul was in a distressful situation. He was in prison. And he says, I know that I'm going to be delivered because you are praying. How many in a stressful situation need prayer? Listen, the body of Christ ought to be praying and expecting that God will deliver you from that. Colossians 4, 3 says, with all, with all prayer also for us, praying for us, that God would open up unto a door of utterance that we might speak the mysteries of God with, without bonds. Pray that the word of God would go forth. And then when he comes to the church at Thessalonica in the first epistle, he just says, brethren, pray for us. He comes now to the end of this second epistle, and he says, listen, finally, brethren, pray for us. May we learn again how to find that quiet place every day and spend time in prayer. May we learn as the church in the 21st century of this thing that Paul learned in the first century about praying always with all prayer and supplication. Paul prayed at all times. He was in a constant attitude of prayer. We need to learn to pray. And don't wait till God has to bring a situation into your life where you can do nothing but pray. And don't make prayer the last thing you do. Make it the first thing that you do. I love what our pastor Chuck always taught us pastors. He said you can do nothing but pray until you have prayed, but you can do more than pray after you have prayed. But prayer is the key. Prayer is the key. Because the Bible again declares that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are attentive to your prayers. So when I pulled over my car and I began to pray, I expected that God would answer that. I didn't know how. This lady didn't know how. There were circumstances that were dire. Man, God was going to have to work a miracle. God was going to have to lead me to the right people to work this thing out. But I will tell you, before the week was out, it was all in place and all in order. And it was everything that we asked the Lord specifically for. Her and her husband came in and we asked specific requests for this situation. Lord, you need to do this, 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 and this. And before the week was over, every one of those blanks was filled in. Say, I believe in prayer. I believe in prayer so much I pray for every one of you every day. If you're on the fellowship list, you get prayed for because I believe the most important thing I can do as a pastor is pray for you. You know, I find it interesting that when we come to the job description of the elders of the first century church. You remember when there was that dispute that took place between the Hellenistic Jewish widows and the, and, and the Jewish Jewish widows. And they were saying, hey man, there's something going on here that's not right. And they came and troubled the, the disciples with it. And the disciples said, listen, it's not right that we should leave the word of God to go wait on tables. Find seven men among you full of the Holy Spirit, men of good reputation, men that we can trust, that we can lay hands on and put them to this task. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. That's every pastor's description. But you know what? More importantly, it's also your job description. Prayer. We need to learn to pray. Not the last thing, but the first thing. Finally, pray for us. Two things he asked for prayer for, and get this, and I love it. That the word of the Lord may have free course, that it might go forth unhindered and be glorified, even as is with you. I love what he says here about the word. Two things concerning the word he wants prayer for. Number one, that it would go with a free course. Now, of course, that would mean that it would go out into the world that doesn't know anything about the Lord and it would have its effect. We certainly want the word of the Lord to go out in such a way that it brings people to faith, that it brings people to salvation, where they can come and be a recipient of God's grace and of God's love. They can be brought back into the family and made sons and daughters of the living God. We want that, absolutely. But there's a second work of the word and you're Participate, participating in that right now, you as a Christian, as the word goes forth, sometimes don't want to hear what the word has to say. Ever been there? Don't raise your hand. I don't like that. How dare he say that? Who does he think he is? Listen, I'm just the messenger. That's who I think I am. I didn't write the book. 
but I'm commanded by God to teach the book. Next week, we're going to start the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy. Then we're going to move to 2 Timothy and on into Titus. And when we get to those pastoral epistles, you're going to read in there with me, and we're going to study together a charge that is on me. As Paul charged Timothy, so that mantle comes down to every man who answers that same call, who stands behind the pulpit and declares God's truth. And this is the charge. I charge thee before God who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. You preach the word. I don't preach all this other stuff. You preach the word. You be instant in season and out of season when people like it and when they don't like it. That's what he's saying. He said, you correct, you rebuke, you exhort, and you comfort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because the time will come when men will heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and be listening to fiction. But you, Timothy, you do the work of an evangelist. You call people to salvation. You make foolproof of your ministry. You continue to teach the full counsel of God. Do you know it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian? That's why on Wednesday nights we go through the Old Testament. Sunday mornings we're in the New Testament. Monday nights, we're here with the men and women talking about the particulars of life from the Scripture. You, you, you make full proof of your ministry. And so the Word of God is important. And Paul is saying, pray that not only does it go out into the unbelieving world and have this effect to bring people to faith, but pray that as it goes out to the believing world, we wouldn't have hard hearts we talk about marriage and the responsibilities in marriage, the man and, the, and uh, uh, the husband and the wife won't have a hard heart, but would hear what God has to say and respond. And we talk about how we ought to live and how we ought to walk, and we're talking about those things from the Scriptures. We will respond to those things. We wouldn't have a hard heart against them. We wouldn't be in rebellion toward them. But that God would give us a humble heart to receive His Word and say, Yes, Lord. I've been disobedient in this area. Lord, I've been failing in that area. I, I, I understand, Lord, that your word is true and it's right and it's righteous altogether. And the problem is not with you, it's with me. And help me, Father. Help me to be obedient. And so Paul prays, number one, that the word of God would go forth unhindered. Pray for that. But secondly, I love this about the word of God, that it would be glorified, that it would be honored, that it would be placed in the church and the highest of esteem. The Word of God. Can you imagine? I see three things dissipating from the church today that concern me as a pastor, that bother me as a believer. I see the absence of prayer. You know, the, 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 the prayer room, although it there's quite a few people that show up every morning at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning to pray for the service. That prayer room ought to be packed in standing room only. The same on Wednesday nights. I see prayer dissipating from the life of the church. I see the Word of God dissipating from the pulpits. And doctrine is being replaced with drama. Drama. And scriptures with skits. And theology with theater. And it bothers me. Because those things will not have the impact upon your life that only the Word of God can have. And here Paul says, you pray that the Word of God would go forth unhindered, but secondly, you pray that the word of God would be held in the highest esteem. Do you know what Psalms 139 verse 2 says? That God honors his word above his name. And we know about his name, don't we? We know that there's salvation, no other name. And that at the name of Jesus Christ, one of these days, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of his Father. That is the name that is above every name. And above that name, God says, I honor my word. Not one jot nor tittle will fail till it all comes to pass. The word of God is forever sure and is forever settled in the heavens. I love that about the word of God because I can go to it now and I can trust it. 
And I've accepted it in my life to be inspired and inerrant and authoritative. And I believe that every bit of it is that. And I don't pick and choose. It's not like a smorgasbord where I can slide my plate along and say, give me a lot of that, but don't give me any of the other thing, whatever that is. No, you have to take all of it as you pass through because it's all good. And I thank the Lord in those areas when He rebukes me and He disciplines me through His Word because He only disciplines those that He loves and He only disciplines those that are His. So he prays for the Word of God. First of all, pray that the Word of God would go forth unhindered. Pray that the Word of God would be held in honor in the highest of esteem in the church of the living God. And you pray for me that we would do that here. And then secondly, he says this, and that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. You know, there's always those people that show up. Um, Paul says, pray first of all that the word of God would go forth unhindered, that it would be glorified and held in the highest esteem of the church, but also pray for wicked and unreasonable men that just kind of seem to show up. I had one of those guys show up yesterday. And I had pulled the church van out and I was going to do some work on it. And uh, because a bunch of us men were going to be loading up in it, we went over and helped uh, Hilton and, and Nita move into their new house. They're moving up from Southern California. It's Terry. Um, Terry's sister, and so, you know, I just get it pulled out, and here comes this car up the driveway, and, and you know, I look at them, and I know, they're not Mormons, because they'd be on bicycles, they're Jehovah Witnesses, and so, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, y- you want me to work on them, and you don't want me to work on the church van, I get it, uh, have them come on, a whole carload of them came on in, only one guy got out. Big tall guy, gray hair, nice looking suit and all that. And, and I, I look like this. This is what I look like all the time. And I'm standing there in my driveway and he, and he walks over and he hands me very politely at first this track. And he said, here, I want to tell you something you probably don't know about. <laughs> oh, really? So I took the track politely and uh, I said, well, I probably do know about it. I'm a Christian. And he said, Really? And then he asked me a question, and it set me off. Mikey didn't like it. (laughs) He said, really? Well, then who raised Jesus from the dead? Oh, don't talk about my Lord that way. And don't talk about one of the essential doctrines of the church. Oh, man, I'm going to tell you what. Smoke was coming out of my ears. I'm standing there, and I'm just, I'm furious instantly. You know, the Bible talks about ra- righteous indignation. I-, I think that that's what was going on. You don't talk about the resurrection that way. And, I, and so, I, tr- listen, I'm, I'm trying to contain. You know my problem is my temper. I'm trying to contain. I said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, okay. I said, why do you lie and deceive people? Why did you drive up my wa- driveway to lie to me and to deceive me? To tell me that Jesus isn't the Christ, he's not the Messiah of God, that he's not God incarnate in flesh, that he didn't die a sinless death, and uh, uh, live a sinless life and die a substitutionary death and raise again to pay for my sins. Why do you lie to people like that? He goes, well, that's your opinion. I said, it's not my opinion. Let me get my Bible. Oh, I don't want to hear it. I said, that's the problem with you guys. You don't want to hear the truth. You want to come and deceive. You want to deceive my neighbors? Man, I went off. I said, no, I'm going to tell you something right now. Look me. God's going to judge you one of these days. You're going to stand before the living God, and you're going to give an account for these lies and this deception because you've not put your faith in the only name above heaven and earth that a man can be saved. And I'm following him into his car. Boy, the windows were rolled down, and the windows started getting rolled up. And I said, I'm, I was upset. Then, then I did something I've never done before. Get out of here and don't come back. And I'm telling my neighbors all about you guys. <laughs> don't you drive up my driveway and try to lie to me and deceive me. Don't you ever badmouth my Savior and expect I'm going to stand still. Because I love the truth. Jesus Christ saved me. He redeemed me. He washed me. He filled me with His Spirit. He rose from the dead. I serve a living God, not a dead religion. Don't come to my drive. But my house? Are you, you came to my house to lie to me? Don't come back.
back. I'm sure there's a big X on my house now. There's an idiot that lives there. Don't go there. God deliver us from wicked and unreasonable men. Now, if he would have sat down and had a Bible study with me, I would not have had to go into the judgment phase of this thing. (laughs) But I quickly had to go into the judgment phase of it because he didn't want to hear the truth. But he would drive to my house. You know, Jesus said of those guys, those religious guys, he said, you travel great distances and you cross great seas to make one convert and you make them twice the child of hell. Listen, we need to pray that the word of the living God would go forth unhindered in our lives and in the lives of those we share that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And secondly, pray. You don't need to pray for those guys coming to my house anymore, but pray (laughs) that God would deliver us from wicked. You know what? That is wickedness. That is deception. That's a lie from the pit of hell that there's salvation in any other than Jesus Christ. I don't care how religious they are. That's a lie from the pit of hell that man would trust themselves. In a few moments, Paul is going to say that we don't have confidence in anything but Christ. I don't have confidence in my salvation in anybody but Christ. I I didn't earn this thing. I wasn't looking for him when he found me. In fact, I'd study with the Jehovah Witnesses. You know, they kicked me out of their church. Here I am, an amoral, drug-abusing hippie, trying to figure something out, trying to read the Bible. And there were some couple really nice-looking gals that were from the Jehovah's Witness Church. And we were trying to hook up with them. And they sort of invited us to go to church. And the next thing I know, I'm finding myself on those Tuesday night brainwashing sessions. And they told me, pick any Bible. Well, I'd had this little white King James Bible that I was angry with that I kept throwing against the walls. I said, I got one. I'll bring it. And I brought it. And they would start telling me these things. I said, that's not true. What do you mean? Wait, 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 wait. That ain't right. Well, how do you know it ain't right? Well, read it loud and read below. Put it in context. I wasn't even saved. And months went on, and finally they said to me, listen, man, you don't come back, and we won't call you. And I thought, wow, I can't live in the world, and now the church has kicked me out, and that's what brought me to the low ebbs on the very verge of suicide when I found Jesus. Don't you come to my driveway. Don't you come to my house and tell me that Jesus isn't who he said he was. And expect me to sit there and keep my mouth quiet. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God that saved me. Not just you. It saved me. And I'm not ashamed of him because I don't want him to be ashamed of me. Amen. Amen. So they got an earful. So pray. I bet you they're still talking about that. I don't know if they have Sunday services down here, but wouldn't that be so cool if that guy accidentally missed the driveway and pulled in here and saw me here? (laughs) Turn in your Bible. That means you, buddy. Let's talk about Jesus. But get this, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, is he not? He says this, let's get it in context. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God, that is the word of the Lord, may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful. I love that. The Lord is faithful whom shall establish you and keep you from evil. I love that. When I'm unfaithful, the Bible says he remains faithful. How many know that to be true? How many know that the Lord is faithful to every promise he gave you in the book? Yeah. Some of those promises to me are so precious. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Present you faultless before the Father of glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise and true God be honor and might, dominion, power, and and righteousness forever and ever. Amen. Jude 24. You see, in the church that I got saved in, they taught that you could lose your salvation. 
And man, I'm going to tell you, you talk about a spasmodic Christian. In fact, every Sunday night we had what they call the evangelistic service where if you lost your salvation during the week, you could get saved again. I never missed any of those. I went on six months losing and gaining, losing and gaining my salvation. That at the end of the six months of my Christian walk, I said, Lord, this is, this is ludicrous. Because what if you come when I'm not saved? You know, when I do something stupid. So here's the deal. And I've told you the story before. So for a week, I didn't go anywhere. I just prayed and fasted. And I really, as far as man's righteousness go, I lived a righteous life for that week. And I remember coming home from church that Sunday and saying, okay, God, today you could take me. In fact, what I'm asking is today you would take me. And I just remember praying, Lord, right now just strike me with a bolt of lightning and take me home. And I was with all sincerity. This was no joke for me. Lord, take me. And I squeezed my eyes shut and I thought, okay, this is it. Uh, I'm going to go to heaven. And he didn't hit me with a bolt of lightning. And so I prayed again, Lord, you don't understand. This is dire. This is serious. You see, I can't live like those other people do down there at the church. You know, I'm a mess. They're righteous all the time. And man, I'm hit and miss. Today I'm a hit. So hit me with lightning and take me home. Because Lord, I want to go to heaven so desperately. I want to have that eternal life that you promised. And I squeezed my eyes again, and boy, he didn't hit me. And now I'm getting mad at the Lord. I said, you don't get it, do you? I'm a young Christian. God understands. I did the Bible roulette thing. And it fell on Romans chapter 4. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord refuses to impute sin because of Christ Jesus. What? I read on. I get to chapter 5. Having been, I mean, listen, I'm in college. I understand tenses. Having been justified. I had to look up the word justified. Having been made just as though I never sinned. By faith in Jesus Christ, I have peace with God. I have, you know, I have access to God. I have hope in God. Man, it woke me up. Then people have been lying to me. They told me God wasn't faithful. But I find that God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to every promise. He's faithful. The Lord, he reminds them as he's closing, the Lord is faithful whom shall establish you. The idea is to strengthen you in the faith and to guard you. The idea is to keep you from evil. The wicked one has no power over you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And get this, verse 4, and we have confidence in the Lord. I'm glad that he said that because Paul earlier would say, as he's writing uh, to the Philippians, he says, I have no confidence in my flesh. Now, if some think that they should put confidence in their flesh, I have the more reason to put confidence in my flesh. I was circumcised the eighth day. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew-speaking Hebrew. You know, concerning religion, I was a Pharisee. And not only a Pharisee, but I sat on the Sanhedrin. I was one of the elite 70. I was a Pharisee. You know, as touching the righteousness that comes by the law, how many could say that? Paul could say, I was blameless. Wow. But he said, these things I count as dung and lost, that I might find or be found in him, clothed in the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have no confidence in my flesh. But I trust the one who saved me. To be faithful to me. To get me from this side to the other side. Just like he told the disciples, get in the boat, we're going the other side. I got in the boat 39 years ago. I can't tell you there haven't been storms. I can't even tell you there haven't been times I got out of the boat and sank. Just to be put back in the boat. But I have every assurance that God is faithful to get me to the other side. Amen? We're going to the other side. I, I just wish that we could hear that land ho today, amen? There it is. We're almost there. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you that ye both do and will continue to do things that we've commanded you. And then Paul gives this little prayer in verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts 
into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. I love those two things. Listen, everything about your Christian experience is contained in that. Because what Paul is praying for is that you would have a passion for the Lord. That there would be that intimate relationship with Him. That the, that the love of God would so grab a hold of your heart that nothing else would matter. You would love not the world nor the things of the world because if the love of the world be in you, the love of the Father is not. Man, you would put God in the most prestigious place in your life, on the throne of your heart. And having loved the Lord, you would love one another. So Paul prays about this love and then he prays about this endurance. The Greek word there is hupomone. It means to endure to the end. To stay in the faith. You know, to defend the faith, to live the faith, and to stay at your post until Christ comes for you. I had a pastor call me last week, and he was just ready to give up. He said, man, you know, things are bad here. The finances are bad. The, the, the church has is, is shrunk down to, you know, some Sundays we only have 20 people. And he said, you know, I, I just, I feel like a failure, and I want to give up. I said, brother, I know for a fact God called you to that post. Is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, listen, then you stay your post until Christ comes. You stand guard right there until Jesus either removes you, releases you, or comes for you. But it's hard. He never promised you it'd be easy. Well, I'm fed up. And I said, I'm pretty sure that there's times the Lord is fed up with you and me too. But he's faithful. And you need to be patient. Oh, there's times I felt like giving up. You know, one of the first songs I ever learned when I was a Christian got saved, I used, I, I played the guitar Many of you don't know that because the problem with the guitar is is it leaves your mouth open to sing. And I should have learned an instrument that you had to blow through because then I couldn't sing with it. But the problem is is that back when I got saved, I started playing the guitar in a youth group and I started singing. They said, no, 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 don't do that. And uh, man, what is that? And so I just had to, you know, and then my youth pastor bawled a guitar and moved away. And I think that was a sign from the Lord that I wasn't supposed to play and sing. You see, I really would like to be a worship leader. That's what, if I could choose anything, I, I would switch places with Ben. He could be up here and be the pastor. He looks more like a pastor than I do anyway. Tall, lean, good-looking guy. And I, and I would just go back there and play the guitar and sing if God would allow me to do that, but he didn't. But he put me at this post. And he told me to be faithful. And he told me to, to speak his word. And to call men to faith. And to teach men who've come to faith how to walk in the faith. And he never promised me it was going to be easy. And there have been those times where I just told the Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. He said, I, I didn't give you a choice. This is not like you got to choose this. And I said, boy, howdy, because if I got to choose it, I would have chose something else. People like worship leaders. They get to sing about love and grace. People don't like pastors because they've got to tell them about sin and repentance. But he said, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. And the gift and callings of God are irrevocable. And and I'm never going to be sorry that I gave it to you. Now, if you run away, you're on your own. But I called you to stand. And Christian, you know something? God called you to stand as well, did he not? This is what he's saying. Paul is praying that their hearts would just be enveloped in the love of God and that they would be patient and waiting for Christ's return. And now there's a few final instructions he wants to give. Wow, how did our time go by so quickly? Let's just run through these real quick because in this, it won't take but a few moments to get through it. There's a couple things in it that we need to look at because in this is church discipline. Now, see, that's another thing that's fading from the church scene today is church discipline. There was a guy that was uh, a professor of ministry 
of divinity that did a wonderful job in writing what the signs of a healthy church are. There are he, he wrote a book called The Nine Signs or Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. Anybody ever read that? Do you know one of those is church discipline? Now, if you don't think that that's true because we're a family and we have a father, we're brothers and sisters, and we have a dad, and this is a family, let me ask you, what would happen in your household if you got young kids running around if there was never any discipline? Do you think that your house might look a little different? So he's going to talk about how to deal with church discipline. And there's two aspects to it. Warn and then withdraw. Warn those that are unruly. He told us back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, to warn those that are unruly. If you're not living the gospel, if you're not walking by faith, if you're not being obedient to the word of God, what he says is you need to warn those people. You know, over the years we've had people come into our fellowship um, that has come to light that they're living together. I have this natural infinity to believe the best for everybody. When they walk in and a couple, I just assume that they're married. But when I find out they're not, I tell them, you cannot live that way because the Bible says that that's adultery, and you, I mean fornication, and you can't do that. Sometimes they will leave. Sometimes they don't leave and they just stay. And you have to tell them, listen, you can't do that here. You've got to understand, if that's what you want to do, what you're looking for is not here. Go out in the world and get your fill of it. Get your full of it. And when you're ready to repent and walk with God, then come back here and you'll find what you're looking for. But you can't live the double standard. You can't have the blessings of God and still live for the world. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world, because if the love of the world be the love of the Father, come out from among them and be separate. What, what do we not understand about those things? Oh, man, now you're archaic. No, I'm an old hippie. I'm not archaic. I'm a biblicist. I'm a believer. You know, I'd like to change the name of this church to the people of the book. Because I want to be a man of the book. Do you want to be a man and a woman of the book? then we're obedient to it. Because in that is the blessing. In that is the blessing. And so he tells them here, listen, watch this. He says this. He says, now we command you, brethren. We command you, brethren. We command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, that's, that's heavy. That you would draw yourself from those brothers that walk disorderly, and do not follow the teaching that you have received from us. Paul in chapter 5 of the first epistle says you warn them. Here's the process. You warn them first. You can't live that way. You can't walk that way. That's sin. That's a trespass against God's word. You need to repent. Now listen, God has no problem with a struggling Christian. And man, if you have something going on in your life that you're struggling with and you've acknowledged it to be sin and a trespass against God and man, you're in the battle and sometimes it eats your lunch and sometimes you have victory and man, you're working this out with the Lord, God has no problem with that. But God has a lot of problems with willful trespass, which is you trying to make excuse for something that God says is wrong. And so when those things arise in the body, here Paul is saying that you need to warn those people. Because those things can shipwreck their faith. You warn them. And if they don't listen to the warning, here's the second step. Paul writes back in 2 Thessalonians, and he's going to say it twice in the last part of this chapter. He says, you withdraw yourself from them. You don't have fellowship with them anymore. Why? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He says this, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Not only did we preach the word of God, but we gave you an example of what it looks like. We lived it out before you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. Listen, we didn't come and, and, and sponge off of you. We worked. But wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. We didn't want you to think that we preached the gospel for gain. Not because we have not the power or the right, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. 
For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if a man does not work, neither should he eat. Listen, do you understand that God ordained work before the fall? Work is not a curse. I like to work. In fact, I like to work too much. I can tend to be a workaholic. And, you know, my body now, I'll, I'll be 50 <clears throat> next few days. And I'm going to tell you, it ain't cooperating with me anymore. And I'm losing my slave labor. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to start hiring people. But work is not a bad thing. And he said, this is one of the things. These guys, because they think the Lord is coming tomorrow, they quit their jobs and sponging off the church. No, 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 no. You tell those guys when they come, you don't work, you don't eat. That'll motivate them. And then he says this, verse 11. Get this as we just end this. This is, this is, this is important. He says, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. There's a play on words in the Greek here. In the Greek, it would read something like busybodies who do no business. They're busy, but their business is other people's lives, and they just mess things up. Now them that are such we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they stop gossiping and sowing discord, that they learn to be quiet and they learn to work and they learn to eat their own bread. And the idea is with singleness of heart. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. He's going to come back to this in verse 14, but in the middle of that, he tells us, don't be weary. And well, how many sometimes you just have thought, maybe the enemy has tried to lie to you and think, man, you know, this Christian life is difficult. And man, there's a huge cost to it. And man, it's just, it's hard. It's too hard. You know, I was, I was thinking on the way over here that I had a conversation with another pastor. The church is small, and he was going to start a Saturday night service and a second service, an early morning service, like at eight o'clock. And, and I was just, I asked why? He said, well, you know, people want to get up early, go to church and get it over with so they can have the day. I said, what? You know, people want to get up early and go to church and get it over with. Get it what? I said, dude, change your church time to noon. And mess up the whole day. <laughs> and find out who wants to serve the Lord. Amen. We live in a society of conveniences. That are void of convictions. Sunday's the Lord's day. And if he's willing to hang on a cross for six hours. And bear the wrath of his father. You mean I can't go to church for four hours? Some wrong. Some desperately wrong. And here he says this: Don't be weary in well doing. Be ye steadfast and movable. Always, it's going to pay dividends soon. It's going to pay dividends soon. And then in verse fourteen, he says, "And if any man obey not the words, the word by this epistle, know that man, and have no company with him." that he might be ashamed. So here again, he's just kind of laying out what church discipline should look like. He's saying, number one, warn the person. Go to him and speak to him. Say, hey, listen, what you're doing is not right. It's grieving the Holy Spirit. It's contrary to the word of the Lord. You need to repent of it. And if you're struggling with it, then I can help you and I'll pray for you and we'll hold you accountable. God is gracious. But man, be in the fray of it. Be in the battle of it. Don't lay down and make, as Spurgeon said, make sin your bedfellow. And then he says this, in case you get a, a self-righteous attitude when you're doing this, he said this, yet count him not as an enemy. He's not your enemy. They're not your enemy. But admonish him as a brother. Yeah, you need to correct, but speak the truth in love. And if after you warn somebody and they just want to continue with stupid behavior that grieves the Holy Spirit, just don't avoid them. Romans 16, 17 says, Note those who walk disorderly and have no fellowship with them. Avoid them. Don't break bread with them. And the idea is that you would hope that they would come to repentance. We have another pattern of Paul, and just let me just go with this and we'll, we'll be done. 
You remember in Corinth, the young man that was sleeping with his father's wife. That would have been his stepmother. And he was having a sexual relationship with, with her. And the elders of the church at Corinth had written to Paul and said, look how loving we are being. Look how merciful we are being. Look how gracious we are being. And we're just kind of tolerating this kind of a thing. And we're kind of hoping that this man would come to repentance. And Paul writes back and said, that's not love. In fact, the next time the church gathers together and I'm with you in spirit, maybe not physically, here's what you do. You warn the man. And if he doesn't repent, you put him out of the church. You tell him he's got to go. He needs to leave. And you turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of Christ. What he's saying is tell him to go out and just live it up if you think that's where it's at. Until you find out that ain't where it's at. It took me 20 years to figure out that ain't where it's at out there. And you get just so full of that stupid lifestyle and so full of sin and you find out that sin by its very nature can never be satisfied and it never brings peace or joy and never gives you what it promises. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will always by its nature cost you more than you want to pay. Don't you know that yet, Christian, about sin? God hates sin because it hurts you and me. It robs us of the blessings of the Lord. It robs us of the peace and the joy that God wants us so desperately to experience. God's not mad at sinners. He's mad at sin. He loves sinners. And sometimes he must have looked at me over the years and go, man, you knucklehead. Man, I had all this for you and you want that? How stupid, but okay. You're my son. You're not real smart, but maybe you'll smarten up later on down the road. Because you'll find out it doesn't. That's, isn't that what Joshua said? Choose you to stay whom you're going to serve. And if you don't think it's right to serve the true and living God, then go try the gods of this world and see how it works out for you. He said you put them out. Don't let them enjoy the blessing of the Lord and God's presence among God's people and the world at the same time. Put them out. And they did. And the work that, that Paul wanted to happen was effective. He repented. And in 2 Corinthians, when he comes back, they said, now embrace him and love him. You know, receive him and show him your love lest he be overwhelmed in the sorrow because now that convicting work is worked. You see, there's, there's three things that ought to be going on in church. And let me just say this. I know we've gone long this morning, but there's three things that ought to be happening. And we'll close out this letter quickly. Three things. Write this down. God commands us to put out of our midst and away from our fellowship and to withdraw ourselves from those who walk disorderly, those who sow discord, those who do not follow the commandments of the Lord. We're called to do that. Not because they're our enemy, because once they get out and they realize the real peace and joy was here, that they'll repent and come back. That's the idea. And the Bible says thirdly that we are to restore repentant sinners. I don't care how bad you've sinned. If you say, Lord, forgive me, then restoration ought to be extended to you. Amen? And we, thirdly, the Bible says we are to fix broken relationships. Read Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go to him and him alone. Try to work it out. If you can't work it out, then take another witness with you. Try to work it out. If it can't be worked out, then bring it to the elders of the church. But you need to fix that broken relationship. So we're commanded to put out from our fellowship those who are in willful sin. After we have warned them and they don't repent, we're to restore repentant sinners and we're to fix broken relationships. That's God's commandment. But you know what the church does today? It puts out repentant sinners. You let somebody fall and mess up, man, and they repented. Ooh. We mark them. Big giant A on their chest. Ah. No, 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 no. If the blood of Christ has washed that sin and they're repentant, man, they're no longer wearing a big A on their chest. Unless it stands for... What would it stand for? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that starts with an H. Hey, hallelujah. That's what it should stand for. That's a good one. <laughs> Had to think there for a moment. That's what happens when you don't preach with notes. You can get out there. And you can get long, too. Um, 
But here's the, so you, re, you restore them. You put them right back in ministry. We don't do that. We put them out. We leave those in who bring destruction, damnable doctrines, and discord, and we fix no broken relationships. Yet Paul is telling this church, yeah, you got struggle and you got problems. We warned you about those guys that are in your fellowship. They're causing problems. You need not to be weary in well-doing, but these people that do this, they're not your enemies, but just avoid them until they come to repentance. Then he says this in verse 16. Now the Lord of peace, I like that title of God. Now the Lord of peace, have you not known him to be the Lord of peace? The Lord of peace that's the first thing that I experienced when I got saved. The very first experience I had with God was peace. It felt like a weight of sin had been lifted off me, and this peace overwhelmed me. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. You know, that verse 16, I was thinking about that this week. I think I might just start ending every service by quoting that to you. Kind of as a benediction and a blessing over you. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Wow. I like that. The salutation of Paul with his own hand which is a token in every epistle, so I write. If you want to know this is for me, I'm going to sign it at the end. Don't believe the other letters. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What a pithy little epistle. Amen. And listen, pray. Pray that the word of God would go forth unhindered to the unbeliever and unhindered to the believer and that it would be held in the prestigious place of honor that it should be. Amen? And pray that God would deliver us from wicked and unreasonable men because not all men have faith. But know that God is faithful and He will guard you and He will keep you and He will strengthen you through every evil attack. And my prayer for you is the same as Paul is that the love of God and the strength of God would be yours. And just avoid those people that don't walk right because that little leaven will mess you up. Amen? Pray for them. They're not your enemy, but don't hang with them. My dad used to say, birds of a feather. How many heard that? Flop together. Like draws like. That saying that I have have nothing to do with them. That came from my dad, who wasn't even a believer when he told me that. There were some kids that moved in across the street. My dad was a very discerning man. He knew those kids were trouble. And I remember him taking me out in the front yard and pointing across the street and he said, son, you see those boys over there? I said, yeah. He says, have nothing to do with them. Because they're trouble. Every one of them today, Zane, Sean, and Pinty, that was their names, are in prison. One of them for murdering his best friend. My dad said, have nothing to do with them. I hear my heavenly father point at things all the time and say, son, you see that over there? Yeah, dad, have nothing to do with it. Have nothing to do with it. Amen? Amen. Well, Micah and Dylan, come on up. Ray, come up with your son. Mom, come up with your boy. Let's stand. I'd like to have the elders come down. We're going to pray. These guys are headed out tomorrow. Not just to any place. I guess they're going to the, from what Ray tells me, now Ray's in the Air Force, still in the active reserves, that Fort Benning is the tough place. And that's the place where you guys are going to learn some discipline. I understand they make you run till you puke and do setups till you vomit. <laughs> Pull ups till you cry there's a tough road ahead for them but you know what this is hard for me and I'm trying to hold my composure because I know I, I don't like it I did my best to convince my son and talk him out of it 
But I know that God called him to this. That's the tough thing. I remember going through this with Doug and Destiny when he came and told me that God had called them to Africa. I tried to talk them out of it. And I remember the night when we were praying in the old sanctuary there and the Holy Spirit was one of our afterglows. The Holy Spirit said, why are you hindering my work? I said, Lord, how am I hindering your work? I have... This was the Holy Spirit saying to me, and then I remember what they did with Paul and Barnabas when the Holy Spirit was there and said, separate. I have separated them unto a work, and you're holding it back. I'm so sorry, Lord. But I don't want them to go. Not your call. It's my call on them. And so these guys are going to go. Cody's already there. You know what? The three amigos are going to end up in the same place for two weeks. They're in Fort Benning, so. And uh, what war stories they're going to have. But, you know, this is hard for Kyle and I because this is the last. This is our baby. Uh, 30 years we've had children. And, and I know Ray, this is his only son. And, man, we're going to send him off. Or so, second son. So, let's pray. Before we pray, I'm going to warn you guys something. And I mean this with all my heart, and you better listen. Amen? Because I'll hunt you down. <laughs> I mean it. Dylan, Micah, love not the world. Nor the things that are in the world. Because if the love of the world be in you, the love of the Father is not. Come out from among them and be separate. Be separate that you might be salt and light in an example. May God use the both of you there in Fort Benning as you stand as a beacon of salt and light. Love not the world nor the things of the world because of the love of the world being the love of the Father is not come out from it, be separate. Touch not unclean things. There's going to be guys who are going to try to say, let's go to the bar. Don't you do it. There'll be fast and loose women trying to flirt. Don't you be like a dumb ox. Amen. And we'll be praying for you. We're going to put your, when you guys get your uniforms, we'll put your faces up there and we'll pray just like we're praying for Steve. Steve, come on down and pray with these guys. You know what they're going through. And the commandment's on you too, brother. Love not the world, nor the things of the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these young men. Lord, we know that there's a call. It's not the call that his parents want to see. Surely it's not the one I wanted. But, Lord, it, it's evident it's the one that you want. And so, Father, as we just studied, and I have to believe it for my son and for Dylan and for Cody and for Stephen, for these young men that are still serving, that, Lord, you are faithful. You are faithful to establish us and to keep us from evil. I pray that for these young men today. That, Lord, you would strengthen them and guard them. That's the idea. And keep them from the evil influences that are going to be all around them. But, Lord, on the top of that, use them mightily as salt and light. May they be a witness. May those in the platoon see them as being different. And what is different about you? And they can boldly say, it's my Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give them a boldness so they would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God into salvation. Now, Lord, they're already signed up to another army. And that army holds their first allegiance. They are soldiers of Christ. And may they understand that's their first allegiance. And their second allegiance would be to this military that they're joining. And, and Father, I pray above anything else that if our country ever gets so stupid to bear arms against Israel that they would just put down their guns and say, I can't do it. I won't disobey the scriptures. And so Father, protect them, keep them, guide them and lead them. And uh, for each and every one of them we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen. Hey, let's just close out with the song. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship.
worship you, O my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Oh, Father, we love you. We're your sheep that have heard your voice, and we don't want to follow any other. We're the sheep of your pasture. And Lord, we love being your sons and daughters. Now, Father, may the peace from the Prince of Peace be ours. Keep us, Father. Guard us. Watch over us. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit, we pray, as we go from this place. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And again, all God's kids would say, amen, amen. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. Make sure that you come up and give these guys a big hug before they leave. They leave tomorrow. <laughs>